Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that encourages good discussion in our community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, author, professor, and nationally known sports economist, Dr. Kevin Quinn. Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College. I'm Kevin Quinn. Our special guest today is Jane Black, who is a Legislative Organization and Association Outreach Specialist for Plant Administrators, Inc. of De Pere, a company that has been in the retirement administration industry for over 26 years. Black has worked to influence legislators on making the problem of retirement security a priority for Americans. She is a member and volunteer of several organizations, and Jane is also the current Mrs. Wisconsin United States 2010, and her platform is Savings and Retirement Readiness. Our topic today, then, is retirement and what it's like to be Mrs. Wisconsin. Jane, welcome to the program. Thank you, Kevin. Well, let's start off with that. Um, you've been involved with these pageants for a little while. Uh, how, how did you get involved with this? How did you wind up being Mrs. Wisconsin? It was a long journey. I actually got involved about 11 years ago when I moved from Green Bay to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I thought it would be a great uh, way to meet new people and do something for me, kind of outside of the box, because I knew that was outside of the box for me. So I entered my first pageant. I was pretty scary. Uh, <laughs> I kind of stumbled around and learned a lot, but the the factor that made me go on was that I met a really good friend who encouraged me to keep doing it. And I found that with pageants, it's kind of in your blood or it's not. So I continued to compete and actually competed three times before I won this title. And I loved each time and I learned so much from it. Well, what does it take to be a Mrs. Wisconsin? What I assume they have a you know, judges and interviews and all that sort of thing. What are they looking for? They're looking for a married woman who can exemplify the qualities of a 2010 married woman. Someone who, you know, they're concerned about family, they're concerned about issues in their community. They have careers or maybe they're stay-at-home moms. But someone who can be a role model. Um, the most important thing that they're looking for is someone who can use the title to make a difference. And that's what I loved most about it, because we are allowed to pick a platform, something that we care deeply about. And it's amazing how that crown really opens up doors that Janie Black can open. If I say I'm Mrs. Wisconsin, they're a little bit more interested. So you get to wear a, a tiara and... I get to wear. Hang around with that. Yeah, I get to wear a crown. Um, I'm. I don't uh, particularly like that part because I don't like anything on my head. But <laughs> <laughs> it, it is amazing to me the power that's in that crown, um, and how you know it does draw attention and it helps to open up conversations. Well, I know uh, that you have used it to uh, get people talking and thinking about uh, some very serious subjects, yeah. and uh, I, you know that's why why we're here today. Um, I checked out your blog, which yeah. is Mrs. Wis Mrs. Wisconsin United States 2010, and I encourage people to go check that out. Mm -hmm. You are a very busy person. I am. Um, <laughs> you get to go to some pretty interesting events in that role. Um, tell us about some of those. One of the best events I would say that I got to go to this year was to go to the Governor's Mansion. I had never been Governor Doyle. And I was invited there because I had done volunteer work with the Wisconsin Women's Business Initiative. And that's something that Governor Doyle really embraces and supports. And it's a nonprofit organization that helps women start businesses in Wisconsin. That is amazing to me because not only do they get to start a business, but they also get to create jobs for people. So I was able to do some volunteer work for them and got invited to the governor's mansion and got to meet his wife, Jessica. And that was that was pretty remarkable. I'm sure I wouldn't have ended up there if I hadn't been Mrs. Wisconsin. That would be pretty neat. There must be some offbeat events, shall yeah. we say, that you get to go to. <laughs> what uh, you know, you travel across the state. I'm guessing, right? And uh, I know that Wisconsin is a place known for its festivals. Yes. Uh, you know, all over the way. Some of those are unique. They are very unique. And one thing I like would like people to realize about being Mrs. Wisconsin is that it's definitely glamour is at the bottom of the bucket. It really is about being involved in your community and helping people. It's not about taking limo rides or <laughs> getting to wear pretty dresses. Um, one of the things that my family and I did, because I try to involve my family in what I'm doing too, 
is we went to the Burlington Chocolate um, Factory Parade, which we thought was a lot of fun, and we spent two days there. But funny story, um, I ne never actually got to ride in the parade because my car never showed up. <laughs> and <laughs> I was left standing on the sidelines in the rain, having to wave at all these floats that went by. <laughs> Oh, that's glamour. <laughs> yeah, that's glamour. But, you know, I was there. I was dedicated and willing to do it. But there are little glitches like that that happen sometimes. <laughs> I would imagine there's a lot of logistics just getting from place to place to place. There is. The, the thing I think I would find difficult in that environment is always smiling. Yeah. That would be, that would be uh, hard. <laughs> and, and, you know, you're a mom. You mm -hmm. have, you know, uh, a family. You have you a do. husband. And uh, you mentioned that they get to go to some of these events, too. Mm -hmm. uh, but you also have a pretty high-powered job. I do. How, how do you balance all that stuff? That's a, that's a question judges love to ask you, actually. <laughs> but the balance really comes in that your family has to support what you do. And just like I support what my husband does. So he picks up the slack when I'm not there, and I do the same for him. And it's just knowing that... You know, you have to be good at organization, which I am, and multitasking, which I think women in general are pretty good at. Um, the other thing is, is I really, really wanted this title, and I really wanted to be out there and make a difference. So it's important to me. The people in my life know it's important to me, and they give me the time to do what I need to do. So it really comes from that. You really have to be dedicated. And when you're dedicated, I think with anything you love, you're able to bring that balance to it. Well, I, as a husband myself, I know that uh, one of the things we have to do is hold the handbag, but he gets to hold the tiara. Yes. <laughs> you are watching Conversations from St. Norbert College. Joining us today is Jane Black, the reigning Mrs. Wisconsin 2010, and we're talking a little bit about what it's like to be Mrs. Wisconsin, mm -hmm. but uh, maybe more substantially, uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the, the projects that you've been involved with. Mm -hmm. um, a uh, number of organization uh, and causes. Uh, we'll talk about retirement in a little bit, uh, but there's been other ones. Uh, you talked about women impacting public policy, uh, Mission ABC, uh, the Special Olympics. Talk a little bit about some of those. Um, Mission ABC is actually a nonprofit organization that I founded. And the reason I founded it is because about 15 years ago, I was diagnosed with dyslexia. At the same time that my son, who was in second grade, was being diagnosed. For me, being diagnosed as an adult, well, of course, was a totally different experience than my child because I had spent the majority of my life thinking that there was something really wrong with me. I really, really struggled in school, and I just put it to that I just was not smart. And that really greatly affected my self-esteem and how I viewed myself, who I am today after learning about my diagnosis and who I was before are two completely different people because after I was diagnosed I realized you know I was smart and that had I gotten the intervention I needed I would have been a lot further along and I would have never entertained those misconceptions about myself so I felt it was really important to make sure that other parents could know what the warning signs are which is something I did not know and um, to give parents the support and the resources that they needed. So I founded my organization, and Mission ABC stands for Awareness Brings Change, because it really does. And most recently, uh, something really cool happened in that I just uh, authored a children's book, and I actually had a girl at West Pier uh, Middle School who did the illustrations for me, and you can actually buy the book on my website. And it takes you through. It's a great resource for parents to use, once their child's diagnosed, to kind of take them through what is it that you have, how is life kind of going to look like, and to make them feel okay about being a person who has dyslexia. I would imagine that you feel pretty alone in second and third grade when mm -hmm. the other kids seem to be picking up this stuff and it's just really hard. You feel very, very alone, and I think uh, I have so much compassion for these kids because they try so hard. The common things that kids will hear is, if you just try harder, unfortunately, I heard many times, how can you be so dumb? The other kids do pick on you. Uh, kids learn very easy and very soon how to hide the fact that they are having problems in reading. Uh, it's, it's easy to do, um, and, and they learn it, and they're ashamed. And actually, in trying to get people to do these illustrations, I had a hard time because none of the older 
kids wanted to uh, kind of be labeled that way. And that's the misconception is they feel if they say, I have a learning disability, what they're really saying is, I'm stupid. And it's so not true because the diagnosis of a learning disability comes when there's a huge gap between your intelligence level and what you're actually able to achieve in reading and writing and comprehension. So. Well, I would imagine that uh, some of the kids that were picking on you in fifth grade had no idea that you'd be in this situation now. So <laughs> no. if there are anybody watching, you picked on the wrong person. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about the retirement issues that you're involved with. Okay. Part of it is the company you work for, PAI, mm -hmm. does uh, some of that stuff. But this has become quite a passion for you. Uh, yeah. Why do you care so much about this? I, you look like you're a long way from retirement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, people think I'm a long way, but I'm really not. I'm 49. And I need to say that up front because a lot of times when I go and speak, uh, I've come to realize that the feedback that I get is people think I'm younger than I am, but I want people to know it was only three years ago when someone stopped me in my tracks and said, do you know your retirement story? I had not owned that story. I really felt like preparing for my retirement was going to be taken care of just by getting a Social Security check. I was under the misconception that 401k um, when I had been offered it before to be a part of that was for rich people. I mean, my employer never really sat down and explained the advantages, but here I was three years ago starting to work for a company who actually does 401k administration. Thankfully, they asked me the question, what are you doing to prepare for your retirement, which I took great offense to. And I understand when I'm out there talking to people and I'm trying to tell them what to do with their finances, um, or at least try to get them motivated to look at these issues, I want them to know it's, it's not, it is my business because I care that you're also preparing for your retirement. Three years ago, I started making changes because I realized that I had this huge gap in what I needed to live a retirement, you know, in a way that I envision, you know, just small things like being able to go see my grandkids or being able to go out for lunch with the girlfriends. Living on Social Security in no way, shape, or form would give me that type of lifestyle. So my husband and I work together to create a plan that we believe now we're on the right track. But I knew I couldn't stop there because 67% of American households are not going to have enough money to last their retirement. Through, They're not going to have enough income. That's absolutely devastating. And the fact that one in five women will live in poverty during their retirement, and that's not acceptable to me. Well, this I mean, this is in many ways a... a uh, a women's issue as well mm -hmm. because I mean women outlive men they for uh, many years yeah. and th these are not earning years typically that's right and you know as the population gets older mm -hmm. um, th this is going to be a, a greater and greater problem it is going to be greater 80 percent of men actually die married and 80 percent of women die single and I am shocked by that but you can see that we're going to bear a greater burden than men and needing more, you know, income. But not only that, women take a lot of time out of the workforce to raise a family. And during those years, you know, they're not bringing in an income. They're not able to save. And that reduces the amount of their social, secu social security check that they're going to get. I didn't know these facts. And I find when I travel and get the opportunity to speak, most people do not know these facts. And I think we need to talk about them. You know, we all need to own that these are the facts and then do things to proactively change them. What I'll bet most people watching have no idea what the monthly Social Security check right. typically is. Mm -hmm. I bet you do. I do. For women, it's $800 a month. $800 a month. Mm -hmm. For men, and this is, an, uh, this is a general estimate that any financial person would give you, uh, for men, it's $1,200 a month. It's 40, basically 40% 40 of your current income is what you will get from a Social Security check. So imagine even if you had reduced some of your cost of living, how are you going to live on that? That's, for a woman, less than $10,000 a year. That is below the poverty line. And I know that from personal experience because it's a fact that today my mother lives like that because she didn't plan for her retirement. 
Um, you know, planning for your retirement is like taking your cod liver oil, right? Yes. Uh, nobody <laughs> wants to admit it. You know, uh, you know, everyone has a New Year's resolution that mm -hmm. uh, they're going to lose weight, they're going to save mm -hmm. more money, they're going to, you know, go to church. I mean, the, the whole yeah. list of things. Uh, but it's a hard thing. I, I mean, you have to go to your financial planner and you have to admit. Mm -hmm. It's like going to confession. You have to admit, you know, <laughs> bless me financial planner for I have sinned and That's I right. have a lot of debt and That's I don't right. have a lot of savings. What do I do? Mm -hmm. um, but they have to do it. They do. And it's, you know, it's okay. You know, as I said, it was only three years ago that I took those steps. And then I come to find out that most of Americans haven't taken those steps. It's okay. And if you want, I always tell people, go to your local bank because there's people there that want to help you with your financial situation. They're willing and it's free. So take advantage of those things. And don't be embarrassed about doing that. Also, right. a lot of employers have, uh, you know, with their 401k, mm -hmm. et cetera, they have uh, some kind of stuff. Um, what do you tell when you go to, uh, I know you speak to various groups. Mm -hmm. What do you say? What is the, what are the walking away points that you give in these in these talks? The three things that I talk about is own it, which is knowing the facts. Let's let's be real. You know, let's be real. What are those facts that surround us regarding retirement? What does it look like? And then to know it, um, know know your retirement story. Know how much money you're going to need to save. Know where you are today and where you want to go. You know, you need to understand what that gap is. And I always say it starts with the calculator. You know, you can, re you can Google retirement calculator and you can go through the process or you can go to the bank and, and sit down with someone and, and do a financial projection. But you have to know your gap. It's like knowing your credit score number. You need to know your number. And then to voice it. Use your voice. Talk to other people. Don't keep it to yourself. I found a year ago... You know, people were not as comfortable talking about finances as they are today because there's more people in the same predicament. And then bottom line, know this, is that 70% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. That's just not people who are in poverty, okay? And a lot of times people think, you know, I've really failed in this regard. We've all failed. These are people who make, you know, $150,000 a year and $25,000 a year. So there's no shame, there's no stereotype face to this problem. It's, it's an us problem. And then know, too, that you can have a voice in Washington very easily. You can write your congressman and stay in tune to upcoming retirement issues and legislation. Get involved. They do want to hear from you. Well, um, as a baby boomer myself, yeah. um, you know, I know that this issue is on my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you kind of think, wow, you know, I wish I would have started even sooner than, than I did, or mm -hmm. maybe some folks, they haven't started at all, and yet, you know, here is the big 5-0 that is staring people in the face. Yeah. Um, but what about younger people, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you're in your 20s, you're worried about just getting started, right? Maybe you have college debt to deal with. Yep. How do you get them involved with this question? How do you even get them to pay attention to this? Right. One of the things that we've done is to start a national college contest called the IOMI Challenge. We really want college students to realize that they owe it to themselves to save for their future. And it's kind of like when you're planning to have a, a baby and you're thinking, when's the right time and when will I ever have enough money? And, you know, people who have kids will just tell you there's never a good time. <laughs> And it's, a kind, it's kind of the same way with saving money. Um, there's never going to be that perfect scenario. But for college kids and, and young people, compound interest is an incredible word that they should really be excited about. Um, if, you are, if you start at the age of 16, and if, if you would, at the age of 16, put $2,000 away, a year, only $2,000, and you continue to do that up to age 21, you would have a million dollars just as your money grew by the time that you get to retirement. So we really want you know young kids to know what we didn't know and obviously what we didn't think was important, which is to save. We want them to take ownership of that, and that's what this contest you know, is all about, is trying to get them excited in that. Well, this uh, is the second iteration of the IOMI contest. Yes. Um, you did one last year. Yep, in tell, 2009. Tell us, yeah, tell us about that. In 2009, it was the you know first time that we launched the contest, and we did have a great response. The question last year was, if nothing happens with the retirement system the way it is today, what's it going to look like in 40 years from now? That should be a very uh, impactful question 
for that age group because that's when they're going to be retiring. And we received some really great submissions, and the winner was actually Western Michigan University, and they had a great proposal, and they got to, part of their prize package was to go to Washington and to meet with representatives and legislators, and they met with senators to propose their ideas. And I think that, you know, it's whether Washington walks away and says that's the idea we're going to use or not, just the fact that these kids know that their representatives do care enough to listen and that it's obviously an important subject to them too. That's, that's very meaningful. And then the winner also got uh, $20,000, so that was nice. For a uh, college student, $20,000. Yes. <laughs> that can pay for books for a semester. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about your experiences uh, as a legislative outreach mm -hmm. person. Uh, you get to walk the hallowed halls of Congress, right? Yes. You get to rub shoulders with senators and congressmen and mm -hmm. their staffs. Uh, that's pretty heady stuff for a girl from De Pure, Wisconsin. What's, what's that like? It's pretty exciting. It's, you know, there's an awesomeness of walking through those halls, getting ready to meet with somebody that you know has a lot of power. And you realize, one thing that you have to realize is when you use your voice, you are helping to form history. You have to know that when you're talking with that congressman and you're sharing, and with me, I always talk about people back in Wisconsin, this is the way that they feel, or generally this is the way that this is what people want and this is what's important to us, that you're helping to shape their opinions and they really do listen. Um, I always like to think the best and um, I'm always very appreciative when a representative actually shows up for the meeting and doesn't get called off to other things and takes the time to listen and is genuinely thankful. It's, it's, it's pretty, it's humbling in a way. So how, how, how does a person do this? I mean, they pick up the phone and they call their <laughs> senator's office and says, I'd like, to, I'd like to sit down with the senator for a couple hours. I, you know, most how people, do you do that? I know. Most people don't realize it is that easy. I guess I'm not a person that's intimidated, and that's what we need to realize is that these are people we have put in office to serve us. And sometimes they need to be reminded of that. So if something's really important to you, and you want to talk to your congressman, it is really as easy as writing a request via email. Um, most representatives have that contact information readily available on their website or picking up the phone. Um, it does help to bug them a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, and really, the more that you do, uh, they do tend to listen. Um, and you want to target the representatives that those would be their issues because you're going to have a better chance of getting in to talk to them. So, it, it, for example, you're interested in retirement. So right. the politicians that you'd like to talk to or the staffs that you'd like to talk to right. are the people that are on that, various uh, very, committees like that. Correct, various committees. And the ones that aren't, you find out very quickly because they're pretty, pretty genuinely honest about that's not really a, a committee that I work on. Um, so I wouldn't recommend wasting your time, but we do a lot of work with Senator Cole's office because Social Security is a very, very hot um, and passionate subject to him. So, Well, what, what is it that government can do? Mm. Uh, what, what are the things that government can do? I mean, you can't make people save more. You mm -hmm. can, uh, you know, shame them, I suppose, into it. But right. what kinds of policies would be helpful to... Uh, to getting people to realize and make it more profitable for them to get involved with this? I, you know, that's, that's a, a huge question. And Washington as a whole is not going to buy into something unless they've weighed the pros and the cons. A really hot issue that's up and coming is auto enrollment, which would make a small business owners who have 100 or more employees automatically enroll their employees. Um, into saving. And I think it's a great idea because it's been proven that if people are just like automatically enrolled um, to save, 96% of them will continue to save. So that, I mean, that's, that's a pretty big bar of people. Um, I think they look at what behaviors are going to drive people to save. And it's, it's pretty loud and clear right now that people aren't going to proactively do it, but if you set it up and you make it easy for them, and it's kind of this auto thing that they will do it, but you know, auto, auto enrollment has been a hot topic for several years if people have followed that. Nothing moves fast in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Say that. 
Yeah, that's true. And uh, as an economist, uh, you know, you wouldn't think that there'd be a difference between an opt-in and an opt-out mm. uh, kind of arrangement for 401ks or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if people have to opt-in, they'll do so at a much lower rate than if they if they have to opt out for some reason. They and it, 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 there's some, you know, question, well, is that mind control, you know, is that big brother, mm -hmm. et cetera. But um, the retirement issue seems to me to be one where there are so many clear market failures mm -hmm. that there's probably some role for government to help people make better decisions about this. You know, n not everybody knows as much about uh, retirement and finances as, as you do, who've mm -hmm. studied it, or I do as an economist. Um, how do you feel about that? I mean, the idea that we're going to, I don't know, trick people into yeah. into doing that? What, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I kind of look at what do other people think about it, and they've polled employees, and employees put that as a a top concern of theirs that they be able to work for an employer where a 401k first of all is offered and then you know they've polled people saying if you know they, they've done trials people who are automatically enrolled because that can be done today it's just not mandated and mandate can be a, a pretty um, scary word for small businesses the way I like to look at it is it's a gift that an employer can give to their employee so it's something that employees want. So I look at that, not necessarily what do, you know, what do I want, I'm a part of that voice, but what do we overall want? Well, uh, not every employer uh, has the ability to offer 401ks. There's right. lots of smaller businesses, and maybe some businesses just choose not to do that. Right. What other options are available for uh, employees uh, that, that don't have access to that? What can they do? The 401k is an easy one, right, especially That's if right. your employer matches it. The rate of return on that's fantastic, mm -hmm. so that's kind of a no-brainer. Right. But what else is there? I encourage people to check into IRAs and Roth IRAs. And to me, going to your bank and asking what are all the options, some people, you know, stocks, mutual funds. I don't like to put myself in the situation to dictate what you should do. There's a lot of financial products out there. I'm more on the back end where I would say whatever product it is, when you go, just don't assume things. Ask for full fleet disclosure. Ask to know, okay, this product looks great, but what are the fees associated with it? Because that will eat up part of your savings, and that's something people need to know. Even in 401ks, there's a huge difference between products. There's an industry average out there that 3 to 5% of most 401k plans, that's the type of fees you're going to be paying. Not many people know that there's you can get the same product for less than 1%, but it's because people are not asking. They're not asking what they're paying for. And in the whole stream of things, at the bottom line, when you get to the end of your retirement, that could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I always say, you know, research the products, but make sure you know what you're paying for, just like you know, look at the whole fall of the the mortgage collapse. How many people really didn't know what they were getting themselves into? Right, that's true. Uh, I, if you think about it, if you get a five percent rate of return on your on your retirement savings, that's right. that's pretty good. But if you're paying five percent in fees, absolutely, it essentially essentially nothing's happening to that, so you don't mm -hmm. get uh, take advantage of the compound interest. And it does happen. Oh, yeah, I'm sure it does. Mm -hmm. So when you're hunting around for uh, the kind of advice, you want to make sure that if somebody is charging you, uh, you know, an extra 2 or 3% compared to somebody else, that mm -hmm. the rate of return you're likely to get from that is an extra uh, 2 or 3%. It's a big, big difference. The DOL came out and said that 1% that you would pay more in fees equals 28% of your income. That could be a loss. So I mean, that is huge. That's huge. So if you're looking at you know Social Security savings of eight hundred to twelve hundred dollars a month mm -hmm. that need to be supplemented by that, th that could be hundreds of dollars a month when you're when you're ready to retire. And yeah. the hundreds of dollars a month can be the difference between you know being able to go out with your girlfriends or or uh, you know, go on vacation and that sort of thing. Yep. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our show today. Until next time, I'm Kevin Quinn. Best wishes for good conversations from St. Norbert College.